Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 91, and today we're going to be looking at Judges chapter 6 and 7. We're going to get the first part of the story of Gideon, the part of the story that most people are familiar with if you know anything about this Old Testament judge. I'm excited to get into the story with you, but before we begin, let's pray and ask that God would open up his word to show us truth that we can apply to our own lives so that we may follow him more closely. Today's prayer comes from the book Piercing Heaven, Prayers of the Puritans, collected by Robert Elmer. This prayer is entitled, I Give You Myself. It's by the Puritan Joseph Aline. Spirit of the Most High, the Comforter and Sanctifier of your Chosen, come now with all your glory, all your courtly attendants, your fruits and graces. Let me be the place you live. I give you what is yours already. Here with the poor widow, I cast my two pennies, my soul and my body, into your treasury. I fully resign them to you, to be sanctified by you, to be your servants. They will be your patients, cure their disease. They will be your agents, govern every step. I have served the world too long, and I have listened to Satan too long. But now I renounce them all. Now I will be ruled by your dictates and directions and guided by your counsel. Blessed Trinity, glorious unity, I deliver up myself to you. Receive me. Write your name on me and on everything I have. Set your mark on me, on every member of my body and every part of my soul. I have chosen your ways and your law. Now I will keep it in my view. By your grace, I resolve to walk in your way. I will be governed by your law, and though I cannot perfectly keep one of your commandments, I will not allow myself to disobey any. I know my flesh will hang back, but in the power of your grace, I resolve to cleave to you and your holy ways, whatever the cost. With you, I am sure I will never lose. So I will be content with disapproval, difficulties, and hardships. I will deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you. Lord Jesus, your yoke is easy, and your cross is welcome, since it is the way to you. I lay aside all hopes of worldly happiness. I will be content to wait and come to you. Let me be poor and low, little and despised here, so I may live and reign with you hereafter. Lord, you have my heart in this agreement, never to be reversed. By grace, I will stand in this resolution where I will live and die. I have sworn that I will keep your righteous judgments. I have freely made my everlasting choice. Lord Jesus, confirm the contract. Amen. All right, here we go. This is Judges chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops... The Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery 
and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizurite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth, and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and put them on this rock, and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock, and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, the Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah which belongs to the Abiezrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the ashtara that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the ashtara that you cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day Gideon was called Jerub Baal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abizirites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, 
Then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. Chapter 7 Then Jerubbaal, that is, Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod, and the camp of Midian was north of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then twenty-two thousand of the people returned, and ten thousand remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you, and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the three hundred men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah his servant to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Bethshethah, towards Zerorah, as far as the border of abel Meholah by Tabath, and the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali, and from Asher, and from all Manasseh, 
and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them, as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. You know, this isn't the first podcast I've ever made. Uh, I've done several others with friends in the past, going all the way back to pretty much the beginning of podcasting. And normally it's a very arduous and and time-consuming process of recording and editing and mixing and finding music that you can use on the podcast and sound clips and things like that to try to put it all together to make a nice finished product. But Anchor.fm makes that all so much easier. Uh, I use Anchor. It is free. And the creation tools that they allow me to use to record and edit the podcast right from my phone or right on my uh, computer, right through my web browser, just make it absolutely effortless. This is an amazing product that they offer uh, absolutely free. And so if you're looking to start a podcast, looking to get anything going, um, if you've got a great idea, I encourage you get out there and do it with Uh, Anchor.fm. My favorite part about the entire process with Anchor is that they uh, will actually distribute the podcast for me. So whenever I'm done, whenever I'm all finished recording, I just hit done and I tell them when I want it to be published and it magically goes out to places like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and everywhere else that you guys listen to. Uh, So it's magical. And you can even make money from your podcast when you get uh, listeners, folks start listening to your podcast, as many people as are listening to the ads that you record, like this one, uh, you end up getting paid for those things. And so it's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, which I would encourage anybody to do, you've got a voice. We want your voice to be heard. Go and download the free Anchor app now or go to anchor.fm to get started. Whenever it comes to the story of Gideon, I always think of the movie A Bug's Life. Think about what happens in a bug's life. You have these colony of ants who are having their food stolen from them by the grasshoppers that come in every year. And they come and they take away all the things that they have diligently harvested and they exact this payment from them. Well, that's the same kind of situation that the Israelites found themselves in during the time of Gideon, except it wasn't to grasshoppers, though... The Bible does say that they were like locusts in their numbers, but they are the Midianites. And these Midianites are coming up against the people of God and they're stealing their food, making them hide in caves and really just causing them to not trust God in the slightest. And so we see a prophet that shows up on the scene before we ever get to the story of Gideon. This prophet shows up and gives a very simple message The people of Israel are not trusting God. They are fearing the gods of the Amorites instead of the God of Israel. God has brought them into this land, and he has taken them this far, and now it's as though they feel like he is left, and they are instead fearful of the gods of the people that are all around them, and they've lost sight of the holiness and the power of of their own God. And it's into this setting that we see the call of Gideon. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon while he is beating out wheat in a wine press. 
And just so you know, this is not where you normally beat out wheat. This is not the place that you would expect. The whole process of beating wheat or threshing wheat is that you're taking this wheat and you're taking a winnowing fork or a pitchfork and you're throwing it up in the air. And when you throw it up in the air, the wind is supposed to blow the chaff away, all the the hulls and the extra part of the wheat, and allow the kernel to fall back to the ground and be collected. Well, that can't happen inside of a wine press because it's a big closed vat. It would be like going into a well and trying to do something involving the wind. There's no wind. They are hiding away, trying to hide anything that they can from the Midianites out of fear and cowardice and sneakiness. And here we see Gideon. This is the place where we find him. And in a bit of a humorous message here, in verse 12, we see the angel of the Lord. This is Jesus before he shows up in the manger. This is a Christophany. He shows up and he says to Gideon, The Lord is with you. Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. And immediately, Gideon responds with his doubting. He responds with his fearfulness. And he says, if God is for us, then why has all of this happened to us? What happened to all of the wonderful things that God did for us in the wilderness and on the way out of Egypt? Why isn't he doing these things Still, you mention the Lord, what has he done for me lately, is the flippant kind of attitude that Gideon has towards God. And he's saying this to God's face. So he is doubting God because of the circumstances that he's in. Yet Jesus here, as the angel of the Lord, tells him that God is with him and calls him a mighty man of valor. We see this man, Gideon, who is a doubting coward, and God calls him a mighty man of valor. And this is not just meant to be a humorous thing. No, this is a picture of the idea that God calls us by the character that he is going to work out in us. We see this happen multiple times in scripture. Uh, I think primarily of Peter in the New Testament, when we see Jesus refer to Peter as the rock, as Petros, because you're a rock. And Peter was anything but a rock. That wasn't his personality or his character. But that was exactly what Jesus was equipping him to be. And so the message here that I I see in this calling of Gideon is that God doesn't call the people that are equipped. Rather, he equips the people that he calls. And so take heart in that. When God calls you to do a task that you feel is beyond you, that is the sign that God is really using you because he is going to give you everything that you need for that calling if it's truly him that's calling you. And Gideon here is blinded. He doesn't even recognize who he's talking to. Uh, He tells him he's going to go get him a snack and comes back and the angel says, well, hey, take it and separate it and put it on this rock and pour some liquid over it. And then he touches it with the end of his staff and it lights on fire and then he disappears. And it's only at this moment that Gideon finally understands, oh man, I was just viewing the presence of God. This was the face of God that I was looking at here. And he perceived that he was in danger. He thought he was going to die because of this. But instead, the Lord said to him, don't fear, you shall not die. And so he built an altar there to God and called it Yahweh Shalom. And God gives him some instructions of what to do. He tells him, okay, Gideon, I, I got a task for you. You are going to be the savior of Israel. You're going to save Israel. And he says, there's no way I can save Israel. I'm the least person, the smallest of my father's household. And my father's household is of the smallest clan of my tribe. He he says, I'm nobody. But as we've seen before, and as we'll see again, God takes delight in using nobodies to do his will. And so he doubts again. But after he's in this presence of God, 
Uh, He's emboldened with a little bit here. And so God gives him a small task that is a pretty difficult task. He says, I want you to go and I want you to tear down the altars of your father. Your father has an altar to Baal and to Ashtaroth, and I want you to cut them down, take one of the bulls, and use the wood from the Ashtaroth pole, and I want you to burn it and put the bull on top of it on that high place and consecrate it to the Lord. It is going to be a sacrifice unto me. Well, he says, yes, Lord, I believe you. I'm going to do it, and he does it. However, he does it during the middle of the night uh, because he's afraid of the Baal worshipers, including his own family, who would come up against him and, and harm him because of this. And so when he does this and they wake up the next morning and find out what he has done, they are hot. They are heated and they want to kill Gideon. But his father very surprisingly steps up here to his defense and makes a very good argument. He says, hey, why are you so angry about what's happened to Baal? Is it your place to fight on behalf of Baal? How about this? If Baal is so powerful, then let him deal with Gideon. Hmm. If Baal has such a problem with his altar being torn down, then let's see Baal do something about it. And so, because of this, Gideon gets a new nickname. He gets the nickname Jerob Baal which is one who fights Baal. And so both sides begin to gather their forces. You've got all of the forces of the Midianites and the Amalekites on one side. And Gideon begins to call all of the other tribes around Manasseh. He calls out to Asher and to Zebulun and to Naphtali. He's going to get yelled at tomorrow in our reading because he doesn't call on the people of Ephraim and they feel a little bit left out uh, in tomorrow's reading. And so here Gideon is, understanding what his task is to do, to save Israel. He doesn't know how that he's supposed to do that. He doesn't understand how he's going to do it, but they have an army. They have an army of 32,000 people, and he says, all right, I need to know that this is from God. And so he's still doubting, and he decides to test God. And this is not a great idea usually. I mean, Uh, In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, we even see, don't put God to the test. But that is referring to the people making a presumption upon God. We're we're unhappy with our situation, and so now we're going to put you to the test to see if you're powerful, and if not, we're getting out of here. And that wasn't quite the way that Gideon was approaching God. He was doubtful. He didn't quite know if this was from God. He had experienced some things, and he was making sure. This is a difficult situation because we're told in Deuteronomy 6.16, which is repeated by Jesus as he's being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, that we shouldn't test God. Yet, in 1 John 4.1, we are told that we are supposed to test the spirits because there are false prophets out there. And so we've got to play with this a little bit and recognize that if you are doubting someone's message, it's okay to have those doubts. We're supposed to take them to the revealed word of God to test them. We don't use fleece to test God. We use the Bible. And so with his questions answered after he uses the fleece for two nights and gets his answer, he says, all right, it's time to go to war. And so they gather up their army, and they've got 32,000 people in this army. It's a good-looking army, nowhere near as big as the multitude that swallows up rivers that they see across the way. But (laughs) if his doubt wasn't already strong enough, God decides to kind of yank the self-reliance out from underneath his feet. He says, this army's too big. I can't use this army. I don't think anybody has ever said that an army is too big, right? I mean, we're Americans. The army is supposed to be as big as it possibly can be. But instead, he says, no, this army is too big. If we use this army and it's this big, then you will never believe that it was me that did this, Yahweh says. He says, I want you to rely upon me. I want you to trust in me and not in yourself. And so look at everybody and tell them, if you're scared, go home. I wonder 
how much Gideon wanted to just kind of raise his hand and go home at this point. Because that's the kind of person he seems to me to be. But he doesn't. But 22,000 other people do. They go home, and that leaves them with only 10,000 soldiers. And that's still a respectable force. And so I can see Gideon going, all right, well, maybe we've got a chance in this. And God says, you don't get it yet. You don't get it. You're not going to fight this war. I'm fighting for you. And so he says, you still got too many people. We're going to narrow this group down even further. And so he says, I've devised a test. Take them all down to the river and have them drink. And he says, any of those that reach down and grab some water in their hand and they drink out of their hand like a dog, keep those people. And anybody who gets down on their knees and sticks their head in the water, send those folks home. It turns out that 300 people are kept. 300 out of 32,000. So with these 300 men, Gideon looks out at the camp of Midian, and he again is shaken in his boots. He doesn't know how this is going to work. This is a thousand years before the Spartans made their last stand at Thermopylae with only 300 people, uh, and they lost that fight. But here we see God fighting on behalf of 300 Israelites against the multitude of Amalekites and Midianites. And so in order to bolster Gideon's confidence, God tells him to, to go and to spy on the Midianite camp. And so he does so, and he goes in, and he hears that they're having dreams about fighting against the Israelites, that the Israelites are going to crush them. They're going to just roll over them. As scared as Gideon may be, the people that he is facing are far more scared of them. They've heard what Yahweh has done. They heard what Yahweh did in Egypt. They heard what Yahweh did to the kings of the Amorites. They heard what Yahweh has done to gain these Israelites the land. And so they are afraid of what God is going to do against them if he shows up. And so with a little bit of a a leap in his step after hearing this dream, he comes back to the camp and he tells everybody, I've got a plan. The Lord has a plan of what we're going to do tonight. We're going to divide everybody up into three camps of 100 people, and I'm going to give you, I went to Hobby Lobby a few minutes ago, and I bought some of these pots, and we are going to put a lamp inside the pot, and you're going to hold it inside there, and you're going to have a trumpet in your hand. Somebody, I'm sure, raised their hand and said, "Uh, Gideon, uh, what about swords? Don't we need some swords? He says, no swords. We don't need any weapons of any kind. We're just going to have pots and lamps and trumpets. And I'm sure that these 300 guys were probably looking at Gideon like, are you kidding me? Like, this is worse than the marching around Jericho seven times and blowing trumpets. This is this is a slaughter waiting to happen. Like, we are way outnumbered here. And Gideon says, don't worry. The Lord is with us. He's with us. And so when I break my pot and blow my trumpet... You follow suit and you do the same thing and shout out everybody, all 300 of you, as loud as you can for the Lord and for Gideon. And so they do this. They cry out a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the entire Midianite army is cast into complete disarray. They have no idea what's going on. They end up killing each other and running away. And the Israelites are able to pursue them and wipe out most of their forces, including two of their princes, and they kill them and behead them and bring them to Gideon. And so in this story, we see an amazing picture of how God overcomes our short-sightedness and our pessimism and our, our lack of hope in God. How God overcomes our reliance upon false gods by commanding us to tear them down and to sacrifice to him instead. How God overcomes our doubt whenever we look at the surroundings and we say, there's no way that God could use this. There's no way that God could use me. He overcomes our doubt. And how God overcomes our self-reliance by not making it about numbers, not making it about dollar signs, but making it all about faith and trust in him. 
And so when we trust in him, when we don't focus on ourself and we cast aside our false gods and we have hope in God, there is nothing that we can't do. And so I wonder what army may be standing against you. What is the fight that you are asking God, Lord, why aren't you here to fight this battle? Why have you gotten me into this situation? Is it possible that God hasn't gotten you into that situation, but you have allowed yourself to get into that situation because of your lack of faith? Step out in faith. God is equipping you to do the very thing that he is calling you to do. Take this message today, take it to heart, and go and get to work for God because he is calling you to do something. I don't know what it is. It's different for every single one of us, but he's calling you to do something. It may be a small task like talking to your neighbor about Christ or coming to church. And it may be something massive. It may be starting a new ministry or making a move with your family. But God will equip you to do the thing that he is calling you to do. He's never going to just ask you to do the thing that you are good at because that does not reveal his faithfulness and his power to a watching world and to you. And so expect awesome things from God and then prepare for it, because he will bring it to pass if you trust in him. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man, and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.